Shalom uh, Rabbi Say, can I be heard? Can you hear me? Okay, this is very exciting. First of all, I just wanted to thank every single one of you that uh, could make it this evening. Um, it's a big schuss for me, but hopefully it'll be a schuss for my Rebbe, Rabbi Moshe Shapiro Tzadik Zichron Livracha. It's rather a bizarre situation because uh, my fast has already sta started, which means my traditional JSU coffee cup is not in my hands. Um, and I, Bez Hashem, Hashem, Kay Hashem, Yachlifu Kayach, Hashem should give me Kayach that the shir should come out the way it's supposed to be. Um, everyone makes the same mistake about Hanukkah. If you go to one of your students and you ask them, Kyle, if you ask one of your friends a very simple question, how does the Hanukkah story end? And they will tell you the way that they tell you because this is the way we've always said things and they all lived happily ever after. That's the way the story ends. The problem is that we know that it's not that way. One of the ways we know that it's not that way is that Hanukkah is very unique when it comes to all the festivals. Every single one of the Jewish festivals is directly connected to a month, which means if I say the, the month Nisan, you think Pesach. If I say Adar, you think Purim. If I say Shvat, you think Tu Bishvat. And that's the way it's supposed to be because a month is directly connected to its Chag and sometimes it's very directly that way. For example, the word nisin, and is there, it's the same gematria as nisim, as miracles. It literally means the month of miracles. And therefore, by definition, in the month of miracles, we have Hanukkah, excuse me, we have Pesach, because Pesach belongs to the month of miracles. And the way the Holy Sfarim teach us is when Hashem created the months, in those months was the potential for the Chag, so really, Pesach belongs to the beginning of time when Hashem created with the letter He, He created the month of Nisan. When I say Hanukkah, which month do you think? And the answer is, it belongs to two months. It is a mistake to say that Kislev is the month of miracles. Kislev is not the month of miracles. If anything, Kislev is the month of battles that precedes the miracles. The miracles happen at the end of Kislev. Hanukkah spills over into the month of Teves. And Teves says, the Holy Sfarim, it's brought down in the Zayar Kadesh. The Zayar says that Teves is one of the three months that belongs to the dark side. Tammuz, Av, and Teves are the three months that belong to the side of darkness. The way the Zayar brings it is by bringing a Pasuk referring to the birth of Moshe Rabbeinu. It says, Moshe Rabbeinu batitzbenehu sholesh yirachim. He was hidden for three months, which means the R of Moshe, which is the R of Terah. For three months, we do not see it. Those three months are Av, Tammuz, and Teves. Teves is a month that belongs to the Sitra Acha, that belongs to Esav and his cohorts. It is the muzzle of Gedi. Gedi is the goat that belongs to Seir, that belongs to Esav. And therefore, Hanukkah ends in the month of Teves, as if to say that there is unfinished business. Indeed, when we sing the song, My so Yeshua, see, we happily sing the words, Az Egmar Bashir Mizmar, Hanukkah Hamizbeach. The word Az literally means in the future, in the times of Mashiach, Az in the end of days, we sing the final ending of the song of Hanukkah, because Hanukkah is basically unfinished business. I'm talking to a group of machanchim and machanches, educators. You work with teens across America, across Canada, and you know in your own blood how true these words are. The story of Hanukkah, the story of Hanukkah is primarily a battle against a different sort of wisdom. The wisdom of Yavon competes with the wisdom of Chazal, of Teresh Peh, the beginning of Mishnayis, was exactly the same time as the beginning of the Greeks. Alexander the Great, he confronted Shimon Atzarik, who was the first of the Tanaim. And there's a war between Yushalayim and Athens. Today is a war between the Ivy Leagues and the, the big yeshivas. And what I mean there's a war, obviously we have no problem with, uh, with going to university. We have a problem 
when the purpose of going to university is to create a, a world without Hashem. And the yeshivas create a world where there's only Hashem. That's the muhammad between us and them. By pure statistical chance, today, meaning your day, I'm, I'm already... Already, I'm already tomorrow morning, okay? But for you people, yesterday, I had a back and forth with one of my students. She was going to a, to a top university, one of the Ivy Leagues. And uh, she basically admitted to me that the reason why she's going to an Ivy League school is because her parents, bless their souls, they're immigrants. From the moment she was born, all she ever heard was the Kedusha of universities. You must go to university. And I asked her, did you ever challenge the premise? Why is it such a big deal? And she said to me, Rabbi, you know that you're crazy. You know you're not allowed to think that way. You know you're not allowed to think that, you know, that yeshiva is actually a greater value than university, that actually Hashem provides parnasa and the idea of worshiping, the idea of universities is something that comes from Athens. That girl, hopefully, Ezra Hashem is brought, she's going to do very well. But that girl is a casualty of the month of Teves, is a casualty of the unfinished business of Hanukkah, is a casualty that you and I are working with all the time when 70% of our youth, they voluntarily will go to university campuses and uh, they have no, no, no care whatsoever as to whether their chevra are Jewish or are not Jewish. So that is the essence of the month of Teves. And as you all know, that the month of Teves comes with a fast. And therefore, by definition, the fast of Teves belongs to Hanukkah, just like Tanis Esther belongs to Esther in exactly the same, to, belongs to Purim in exactly the same way Asar Teves belongs to Hanukkah. The way my Rebbe, Ramesh Shapiro, Tzadik Zechron Nevracha, who's Yartzeit, we will talk about at the end of the share. The way that he says it over is the following way. Ramesha says that the Rambam, when he describes the nature of this Tanis, he says, the Rambam says that we're celebrating that Nebuchadnezzar, the Rasha, this is I'm quoting now from Hilchas Tanis, Perak Hey, Halacha Aleph. The Rambam says, and I quote, Sheboy Samach Melech Bavel, the king of Bavel, put Nebuchadnezzar, Harasha al Yushalayim. They view the matzar or the matzok. Matzar or the matzok. Matzar literally means a siege, and matzok means that we were we were straitjacketed. We could not express ourselves. We were placed in a situation where we had no way that we could come in or could come out. So that story of Babylon happened way two hundred years before the Greeks. Nevertheless, says my Rebbe that that was the foundation of the idea that they put us into siege, meaning just like you can have a physical siege, you can also have what's called a cultural siege. Uh, Reb Dave, you can't drink coffee in front of me. That's literally leg Laroche. You cannot do that. It's a tease. It really is, okay? Especially you look like a good like Canadian mug that you have over there. The bottom line is, is that when you talk about a siege, a siege means I cannot express myself. So today, the yeshiva world and the intellect that the yeshiva world stands for is under siege. We can't be ourselves. We can't just do whatever we want. Everything has to be done through the yes and the no of Yavon. Today, Yavon can come in many different forms. It can be a, a secular Israeli government, or it can be just a cultural mindset that university is something that we have to worship for its own sake. Again, I'm not in any way saying um, that, that it is wrong to have a, a, a university education. On the contrary, the Rambam himself, the same Rambam that I just quoted, calls the university, calls the wisdom of the Greeks, the great handmaiden, the great handmaiden of Torah. And he had, in Murray Nebuchadnezzar, he had tremendous respect for Aristotle and his cohorts. It becomes a problem when we allow them to put us into a, 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 a mental strait where we have to think through the way that they think and we can no longer set ourselves free and allow the proverbial horses to run in the way that we think, the way that we think from the base of Medrash. 
that has been lost. The Beis HaMedrash is no longer controlling its own destiny. It is under the auspices of Athens. It is under the auspices of Alexander the Great and Aristotle and Socrates and Plato. That is the siege that we're in, in the world of Seichel. But today I want to talk about something different. Whenever we talk about Yavon, whenever we talk about the Greeks, the Greeks actually had two pillars that they stood for. If you boil down everything you learn about Yavon into two huge big ideas, there are two big ideas. Number one is Seichel, is the intellect. They brought intellect into this world on a whole different level, and they remain to this very day the bastions of intellectual thought goes back to Athens, but they stand for something else. That something else is Yoifi. They stand for beauty. Beauty is something that they were, that they placed at the centerpiece of their wisdom. And um, I want to talk about this in great detail in a moment, but it's important to remember this, that the reason why we hate Yavon so much the reason why we call them Chayshech is Dafka because they are fighting on our turf. It's not like Esav. Esav is a bad guy. al he fights with his sword. So we know how to deal with that. Persia is pure hedonism. We know how to fight that. But when it comes to the Greeks, they're fighting dirty. They're fighting on our turf with number one, Yoifi, and number two, Sechel. You can say anything you want about the Jewish people. You can say that we poison the wells. You can say that we cause communism. You can say that we're behind every single evil that exists. Apparently, Jews are the ones that made the Pfizer, the Pfizer, um, what's it called, the vaccines. Jews are behind everything. We control the world. But no one has ever accused the Jews of being stupid. And the same thing is true about the Greeks. When it comes to Yoifi, when it comes to beauty, as we're about to learn together, Yoifi is the centerpiece of Aramuna. Everything we need to know about Olam Haba boils down to the word Yoifi, which means beauty. So to understand what it's all about and to understand the way they see it is centerpiece, is crucial to understanding Terah Hashkafa. Comes along the Chasm Seifer and says something extraordinary. The Chassam Sefer teaches us, we all know that everything that happens in history, you can find in the book of Bereshis, you can find in the book of Genesis, Sefer Bereshis is the kernel, it is the garin, it is the foundation block of every single story in history. So the Chassam Sefer drops a bomb and says, Maisei Avais Simen Labanim is the story of Yosef. Yosef is the one that is the, 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 the pre predecessor, the one that creates the foundation block to the wall between us and them. Now, it could be you've heard other opinions. Um, the Chassam Sefer himself, if I'm not mistaken, also refers to the story of Shimon and Levi and Dina. Um, Rav Hutner famously talks about the fight between the angel of Esau and Yaakov Avinu and Parshas Vayishlach, but the Chassam Sefer points out a few very interesting things. Number one, we always, always, always read the story of Yosef during Hanukkah. He doesn't say this, but I would like to add, during the story of Hanukkah and during the month of Teves, during Aser Teves. Vayeshev, Miketz, Vayigash, Vayechi, is the battle between Yosef and his brothers, primarily Yehuda, and they spill from Kislev into the month of Teves, and they cover the festival of Hanukkah, and they cover Asara, but Teves is the story of Yosef. <clears throat> For those of you who remember the Gemara in Shabbos, the Kaf Beis Amid Aleph on the top, the, when the story of Hanukkah is introduced simultaneously, it is introduced with the story of Yosef being placed into the pit. It seems to be that the reason over there is a tangential reason, how high should the menorah be? But the bottom line is, it's there for a purpose. You're starting the sugi of Hanukkah, think Yosef. 
continues the Chasm Sefer and says, there's a Pasuk in Zechariah. The Pasuk in Zechariah is very explicit, black and white, that the, that the source of the Hanukkah story and the source of Yosef is one and the same, is Zechariah Perak Tes, Pasuk Tes. And again, Yosef's name is not mentioned, but we know that one of the names of Yosef is Tzion. Tzion is Tzion Michlal Yefi. Tzion is the beauty of Mokom. Tzion is the beauty of space. And Tzion is Gematria Yosef for a reason. Just like Yosef was the most beautiful man that ever lived, Tzion is the most beautiful place that ever lived. Yosef had another name. Yosef is called the Tzadik. And if you look, picture in your mind the word Tzion, Tzadik, and then Yud Vav Nun. Yud Vav Nun reads out Yavon. So literally, literally Tzion is the Tzadik that wages war with Yavon. By the way, that idea is not the Chasm Sefer. That idea is the Al Alshech. The Alshech HaKadosh brings down Tzion. Michal Yefi is the Tzadik that overcomes Yavon. Let's read these Tzukim together. The Pasuk says, and I quote, Gili mi oid bas tzion. Hari bas yushalayim, bas tzion, tzion, meaning the children of Yosef should be filled with happiness. Hinei malach yavoy l'cha. I will send you a messenger, tzadik. He will be described as a tzadik. Remember in Chumash, you have Avram Avinu, you have Moshe Rabbeinu, you have Aaron Hakayin, you have David Hamelech, you have Yosef HaTzadik. So when Zechariah talks about the Tzadik, the Tzadik is always Yosef. Continues the Pasuk, Shalachti <clears throat> Asirayach. I sent you a prisoner, Mibar Ein Mayimbar, from a pit without water. Now, you can't get more explicit than this. Zechariah says everything without actually saying the word Yosef. I sent you a prisoner from a pit without water. In history, there was only one case of a prisoner that came from a pit without water. He started off in a pit and he ended with a pit. Uh, just again, Rabbi Menachem, Zechariah, Perak Tes, Pasuk Tes. Perak Tes, Pasuk Tes. That's where you find it over there. It's incredible. He says, I sent a prisoner from a pit. He starts off in a pit. And when he comes to become the king of Egypt, they take him out of a pit. And then finally, the famous Pasuk, Vairarti. I will awaken the children of Tzion and they will overcome the children of Yavon. The final showdown at the end of time will be the children of Tzion, the children of Yosef and what they stand for and what you and I are fighting for and we will eventually push out the darkness that is the children of Yavon. Vairarti b'nayich Tzion al b'nayich Yavon. My dear friends, when I say the word va'orarti, I want you to put this in the back of your mind. Orarti comes from the Lashon Na'ar. Na'ar, his iris, the idea of to awaken. Rabbeinu Bachir says the word Na'ar means something that you need, that, that, that is in constant growth mode. A little secret. The reason why we do NCSY with teens uh, you're not allowed to say this too loud. This is a secret between us. The power of teens is because they are in that age group in growth mode. I know things are changing. Thanks to the internet and marijuana, they're no longer in growth mode. But without that, if you take that out for one moment, they, it is the, the period of their lives, the teens, is when people are constantly thinking. That's why they are so such a great a group of age to be able to try and make them think differently, to be able to come near to them. Who was a person described as a Na'ar? The first person to be described as a Na'ar, well, there were people before that who were Na'ars, but the first person who's described as his essence. You all know from, from Reb Tzadok HaKayim that the first time you're introduced to a biblical character, the first word you see, it's their essence. Yosef is introduced as a Na'ar. Vuhu Na'ar is B'nai Bilha, beginning of Parshas V'yeshev. Rashi says the word Na'ar is something negative. 
Let's look at what he says. Rashi, um, the beginning, Vihunar, show you Oisei Maisonirus. He behaved like a teenager. So again, I don't just teach te teens, I raise teens. So I actually have teens living in this house as we're speaking. And no offense, Kyle, but you're not an easy age group to have in your house. It, it comes with complications. Teenagers are strange this way. Teenagers are obsessed with their own vanity. Teenagers spend obsessive amounts of time looking in, at the mirror. Says Rashi, quoting the Medrash Rabbah, and says the following, Yosef was a nar. You know why he was a nar? Let me quote to you. Yosef my sinerish, metakin besairo. He was constantly fixing his hair. Omamashmesh be'enav. And he was constantly playing with his eyes. Kideshi enira yafe. So you should look beautiful. So I know what you're all thinking, says Rabbi Nissel. The reason why you don't play with your hair, because you don't have any. But the bottom line is, is that Yosef Hatzadik, he was a Nazarite. He was a Nazir, as we all know, or the Kodkite Nazir Echab. He was a Nazir. He had beautiful, beautiful long hair. And the Medrash in Mikates describes him that his beauty was beyond human comprehension. We're talking about my, my, our gender, the male gender. Never in the history was there anyone so beautiful, nor will there be anyone so beautiful, with the possible exception of Absalom, which is a different parish. We're not learning Navi now. But, but Yosef was the essential beauty in the, in the male gender. What did he do? He worked on his eyes. I have no idea what that means. He kind of, to be honest, it kind of creeps me out a little bit. The idea of a male uh, fixing his eyes. I know the Egyptians apparently used makeup on their eyes, both male and female. Uh, I have no idea what that means. It just weirds me to no end. But we had Mamashmesh. He was doing it to make sure that his eyelashes were properly curled or whatever it was that he was doing. And then he was the Masalsil the Sarosov. He was fixing his beautiful long hair. He was braiding it doing whatever he was doing to it. And therefore, the brothers looked at this young man, Yosef, and they said about him that he's not one of us. This person is not one of us. And they condemned him to death. And we're going to see a little bit deeper where the brothers are coming from. It is crucial when you learn the story of Yosef and the brothers. You don't look at it through the lenses of Joseph and the Technicolor Dream Co. That's how I grew up. London in the 70s, Andrew Lloyd Webber. It ruined my brain because when later on you find out that each one of the Shifty Co. I mean, think about it, the Shifty Co. were at least bigger than the Baal Shem Tov. I hope Derek doesn't get offended. But they were at least bigger than the Baal Shem Tov, which means that they could, for sure, they could transport themselves from one place to the other with Kvitsas Haderach. They for sure, each one of them had the ability to bring the dead back to life. They for sure in Parshish Miketz could see that what Yosef shechted for them had the aura of Kedusha, like every good Hasidic Rebbe can do. These people had Ruach HaKadosh. No one had more Ruach HaKadosh than the, than the Shvatim, except for Avram, Yitzhak, and Yaakov, and Moshe Rabbeinu. After that come the Shvatim. Come the shifty car. They are the Amudim of the world. And they said, Yosef is Chai of Misa. And they saw the first thing they saw is he was a Na'ar. They saw that he was the mice and Nairus that he was doing. So we have to, we know the end of the story. So we have to go back and realize that Yosef clearly was not what the brothers thought. And as we're about to learn together, not only was Yosef not the beauty of Yavam, his whole life, his whole purpose in coming down to this world, his whole, as we say in Kabbalah, his Midas HaYesayid, which he stood for, everything about Yosef was the antithesis of Yavam. His Yafi was something that came from day one, from the moment that he was a Na'ar, from the moment he was a Na'ar, he was already focused on Prophet Zechariah saying, Va'irati, Va'irati, I will awaken. The same word as Nar, Va'irati, Benayach Yavam, Benayach Tziyayin, 
al benayich yavon. So what is he all about? And what is this battle? And what does it mean to us in 2020? And why is it that tomorrow for you and for me already starting now, this is a time when we fast and we cry and we say, and we say, and we say, slichais, what is going on behind the scenes? So let's begin and ask ourselves the question, what exactly is Yafi? Why is Yafi such a big deal? So it's interesting that Yosef Hatzadik, he receives four words to describe his beauty. In Parshas Vayeshev at the end, he's called Vaya Yosef, Yefei Toyar V'yefei Mara. Yefei Toyar V'yefei Mara. The simple meaning of these four words is that his Toyar means the proportions of his body, they were perfect, V'yefei Mara, and his face was beautiful, his visage was beautiful. Interestingly, there's only one other person in Chumash that gets four words, and it's the same four words to describe her beauty. Who is that? It's Rachel Emenu. Rachel Emenu is described in Parshas Vayetze as being Yifas Toya V'yifas Mara. The Medrash mentions that he had the beauty of his mother. It's incredible that we know from Rashi that he looked like his father, but we, he looked at his father in a way everyone could say, Yosef was the son of Yaakov. But his beauty, everyone said, if I can quote Snape, he had his mother's eyes. It was something about him that he, that he, that he, he looked at Yosef and the beauty that he had, Yefas Toyar, Yefas Mara, that he got from his mother. Rashi, does for us a big favor. Rashi says, you know what? I'm going to give you a definition of what it means, Yifas Torah, and I'm going to give you a definition of what it means, Yifas Mara. Yifas Torah, says Rashi, this is Rashi in Parshas Vayishla, excuse me, Parshas Vayetze, talking about the beauty of Rachel Emenu, and says the following words, and I quote, Tsuyar is Tsura Saparsuf, literally the Tsura, the, the form of the parts of, of the way that the face comes together. And Mare is Ziv cluster. Ziv cluster means the shine that comes out of his face. So apparently there's two dimensions in his beauty. The first dimension is called Tsura Saparsuf. And the second definition is called, is called Ziv Cluster. What I'm about to share with you, I heard this from my Rebbe Ramesh Shapiro Zatzal. It's something that, that we say, Rashi says it in Chumash. Rashi says it in Chumash to describe Rachel Imenu, which in turn describes Yosef. And every single expert in the secular world, all the Bnei Yavam, they know exactly the same thing. They understand that Yafi is built on two pillars. The first pillar is called Tsuras Hapratsov. Tsuras Hapratsov, if you, if you type into Google, what makes beauty? The word that will come up the most is the word symmetry. So um, symmetry is not exactly the correct word because symmetry means that if I would put a line halfway down my face and flip this side to this side, it would make me look beautiful is not exactly true because actually it would make you look like a Japanese CGI model. It looks, it'll look creepy. It doesn't look real if you do it exactly like this. It doesn't look correct. But one thing's for sure, if I had shifty eyes, that one eye was a millimeter higher than the other, or my, my mouth curled up this way, it would be unappealing. The essence of Yafi on the first level. The essence of Yafi is not so much symmetry as harmony. The Yafi of the human face is exactly the same as the Yafi of music, is exactly the same as the Yafi of architecture, and it's exactly the same as the Yafi of, of a beautiful landscape. It's how the different components fit in with each other. So what makes music beautiful? What is the yafi in music? It's harmony, 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 harmony. 
everything comes together perfectly. That is the yoifi in music. What's the, the yoifi in a landscape? You see mountains, and right next to the mountains, you see beautiful, beautiful valley, and you're breathless by seeing the contrast, by seeing how the various things come together. So, so the, 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 the same thing is with the human face. It's how the different components fit in with all the other different components. That is the essential yoifi. So again, what we and the Greeks have in common is that we all understand with complete and total clarity that there is a thing called a baseline. The baseline of yoifi is always that things have to fit in with everything else. In Hebrew, it's called hatama. Hatama means everything, everything works beautifully, a beautiful painting. It's not symmetrical at all. It's not symmetrical. It's the way that it works together. If I had time to talk with you and discuss it with you, my, my primitive understanding of modern art and my primitive understanding of music genres like jazz, it's the same idea. It is a yoifi in how the genius behind the music or the art puts things together in a way that gives us his iris. It gives us an inspiration. It awakens us. That is the first base in Yoifi. But Yosef and Rachel were not Chas Yefei Toyar. They were also Yefei Mare. Yefei Mare, Rashi says, Ziv Klaster, their faces were shining. What on earth does that mean? So here we see something incredible, amazing, that the secular world knows this back to front. They know if you want to find beauty in this world, it's not enough to have symmetry. It has to be that there's something behind the symmetry that tells a story. Allow me to explain. We'll start off with the secular world. Unfortunately, we all know there's a thing called a beauty pageant. To be honest with you, even when I was a high school kid, I couldn't understand how how the world could allow something so demeaning to the female gender. A bunch of men sit there and they rate women from one to 10 like cows. It doesn't make any sense. And they come one after the other. At some point or other, these poor ladies who are submitted to all this objectification and they're walking around like Chava before the Chay. And suddenly out of nowhere, they get asked questions to see if they have a brain. It's a, it's a crazy thing. So poor Miss Venezuela is whatever her name is, Bimbo Gonzalez. They ask her and say, Senorita, what would you like to do with your life? And she says, whatever, she remembers her line, I want to be a veterinarian because I love children. So, okay, that's beautiful. We're so proud of you. She wants to save the penguins. Who cares? The whole purpose of a beauty pageant is to grade you on whatever is the value of beauty as, as whatever that particular era in history considers beautiful. Who cares if you have a brain? So I want to share with you an article I saw. It was called the Susan Boyle Effect. For those of you who do not know about Susan Boyle, the younger generation, if she would walk into your room right now, you would immediately give her a mop and tell her to start cleaning. That's the way she looked, that's the way she dressed. The moment she opened her voice, you would literally melt from the beauty that Hashem gave her and the, and the beauty of her voice. So about 15 years ago, an experiment was done. I don't remember the details, but they took 10 different, 10 different places in the world. One of them was Israel. They took, I don't remember the details, but they took, let's say, 30 American college kids and they brought them to Israel for 60 days. 30 college kids, it was for an archeological dig, whatever, secular American kids for 60 days. On day one, every single person there had to rate every other person from zero to 10, on, excuse my French, hotness. That's what they, it was called. I don't know what it is, 
But when I was growing up, it was good to be cool. At some point it switched and it's now good to be hot. Whatever it is, I'm quite happy to be parv. You know, it's perfect for me. But the point is, is that they got raided. 60 days later, when the archeological dig was over, they did it again. And once again, they were rated from one to 10. There was one girl who went from being, I don't remember the numbers, but let's say she went from being a five to being an eight. And, and they couldn't understand, it's not possible to go from five to eight in 60 days. Not even if you come from Venezuela and you get, you get surgery, you can't do it. You can't go from being a five to being an eight. So what happened? So they found out and it was consistent across the world. Whenever they did this experiment, people literally became more beautiful because these were the people that were most beloved. Meaning this particular girl was the one that everyone else, if they had a problem, they would lean their head on her shoulders. She was the one who very, very, in a beautiful way, would clean up behind people, take care of people, look after people. She was a pleasure to be around. So she physically became more beautiful. A person who has a good marriage. So your spouse remains physically beautiful to you. I see Rav Moshe Freilich, other friends of mine from Miami. How can it be? You see Miami, these old couples. And, and, and there's all that stuff going around in Miami and they only look at each other because they've always looked at each other. They see each other as beautiful because they see what Rashi calls over here, Ziv Klaster, the beauty that comes from the inside and it bursts out into the outside. In other words, there's an understanding that real beauty has to have a panemius. It's the same reason why every painting has a title because the author, wants you to hear, to see the painting and the painting should take you beyond. Every piece of classical music has a title to it because the title is supposed to direct you to whatever is the panemius that the author wants to take you to. And I wanna share you something incredible. And again, what I'm about to say to you now is from Ramesh Shapiro. It's something that, that shows how everything that you and I have always thought he'll always take it one level deeper because you've read this Rashi hundreds of times. Everything I'm saying to you now, it could be that you've thought of these ideas, but I wanna ask you a very simple question. <laughs> if I would ask you the human face, where is the yoifi in the human face? So it's possible we could go back and we could have a discussion about this. And those of you that work with your NCSY teams, do so. Let the kids come up with this answer. Number one is always going to be the eyes. For some reason, <clears throat> whether you're an NCSY team or you are a professional writing for the beauty section in Vogue or Cosmopolitan, or you're a fashion expert from Milan or Paris, eyes always come first. What comes second? So here it's not so simple, but if you ask the question the following way, what part of the human body, the human face, naturally is like a storm, but if you work on it and you work on it and you work on it, so eventually it becomes something of tremendous yoifi, the answer is the hair. The hair has is something first thing in the morning, it's like, it's all over the place, literally. As Chazal say, the Hebrew word for hair is sa'ara. Sa'ara, a samach and a sin are interchangeable. Literally, hair means a storm. So you wake up in the morning and my pay is all over the place. I'm just kidding. Okay, the, yeah, it's, it's a storm. Then what do you do? You take that hair and you start to give it direction. You start to give it harmony. You start to give it symmetry. A, 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 a typical scalp has 10,000 hair follicles. If you are a real redhead, you'll have 12,000. If you are a real blondini, you'll have 8,000. That's a lot of follicles. If you brush them and you try and turn your hair so that you look like some kind of a Pantene model, and then afterwards you braid them the way Hashem braided the hair of Chava when she was presented to, to, to um to Adam Arishon, when that moment happens, so the braiding of the hair is the ultimate in what's called 
harmony and cool symmetry and how everything comes together. So hair is that part of the body that symbolizes the yoifi in symmetry, the yoifi in harmony. The eyes work differently. The eyes symbolizes primius. I don't have a makar for this. If any of you can give me a makar for this, people always say that the, the eyes are the window to the soul. I understand a little bit at Pimach Shava that it should be that way. The light comes out through the eyes. So it is true at a certain level. But the eyes, more than anything, is the yafi of the eyes is the pnim, which is why ayin and mayan. So Rabbi Moshe Friedman points out already that ayin comes from the word mayan. Okay, mayan. Is something deep wells. You go deeper and deeper and deeper and you bring out more and you bring out more and you bring out more. Is the yoifi of the iron. So when the aforementioned couple on Miami Beach, when the husband looks into his wife's eyes, he sees the same yoifi, he sees the same yoifi that he saw under the chuppah. Okay, so you know, underneath there's bags and there could be cataracts, but the twinkle, the, the twinkle is something that is something that brings out the Pnim. While I have your attention, I would like to point out that you cannot see the Yafi of an eye through Zoom. It's like a crazy thing. Okay, Zoom is a Sheker. Zoom is, a, it, it looks like that you're looking at me. You're actually looking at pixels. You're actually looking at a screen. It, the, the, the Kaya Hadimian, you're looking at me, but you can't, the Yafi of the eye does not come out in the same way that my Tzalem al Kim is not communicated to you. That can only happen in real time. But that's it. The yafi of the eyes is the yafi of seeing the pnim. How beautiful is this, Rabbi Sai? How beautiful is this? Let's go back to our friend, Yosef Atzarek. Yosef Atzarek, when he was a nar, when he was a nar, what was he doing? He was, once again, he was mamashmash be'enav, and he was mesalsal besarosok. He was working on his eyes and working on his hair. He was working on the pnimius, uh, excuse me, on the harmony of Yafi, and he was working on the pnimius of Yafi. I never saw this anywhere. It's my own observation. Later on in the parsha, later on in the parsha, we see that when he gets sent down to Egypt, it says that uh, when when Rashi brings down the famous Rashi that he was mis once again. It says Yefas Torah, Yefas Mara. He says that he was started to work and he was playing with his hair once again. So Rashi brings down that he was Masalso the Sarasov. Rashi doesn't mention that he was working on his eyes anymore. I looked up today in the Medrash, the Medrash mentions the eyes, but Rashi skips the eyes. Why did he skip the eyes when he came down to Egypt? The answer is is that working on your eyes can only exist when you're with your brothers, when you're with Yaakov Avinu, when you're with Kla Yisrael. Because the pnimius that the eyes represent have no meaning in a place called Mitzrayim. But the hair, the harmony of the hair, that doesn't matter between Jew and non-Jew, it's exactly the same criteria. What I'm saying is, is that the Greeks and the Jews are 100% on the same page when it comes to symmetry. In other words, what we call yafi of what's called hatama, what Rashi calls tsuras haparsuf, tsuras haparsuf does not make any difference whether it is a Jew or a non-Jew, a Greek or Kla Yisrael, we see the same yafi in symmetry, the same yafi in nature, the same yafi in a piece of classical music, which was Shimon Schwab, said that he the, talked about the yafi of classical music, he meant it, he knew what he was talking about. That's the yafi bagayim tamin. But when it comes to the pnimius representing by the eye, that's the place where Yosef is waging war against, at that time then was Mitzrayim, but ultimately was against Yavon. So this is the punchline of my presentation because it's really a very, very deep and powerful idea. And that is the following. The Greeks knew that Yafi has to have a pnimius. 
That's the only reason why they want to know whether Miss Venezuela wants to whatever, save the turtle. That's the only reason is because they need some kind of a pnim. It's just that their pnim is kulay kule sheker. That's why they're kul chayshech. That's why we hate them so much. It takes you into a pseudo pnim, a pnim that gives the illusion of emes. But really it's not a pnim at all. Every single time, I, the, the example I always like to give is in Madrid, there is the most famous painting ever drawn in the 20th century, it's the La Guernica of Picasso. And that painting is a painting against war. It's about the Spanish Civil War. Millions of people pass in front of it every single year. And they're all in awe and they're all inspired. I can guarantee you that not once, not once did anyone say, you know what? I'm so inspired today, I'm gonna to be nicer to my husband. Today, I'm gonna to be nicer to my wife. Never happened. It's always a fake Pneumius. You come out of a classical concert and the classical concert is supposed to be more you to being more civilized. So what do the Americans do? They eat, they go straight from the concert and they fress. What do the British do? They drink alcohol. It doesn't make any difference. It's the same thing. They don't bring the Yafi into a real Pnem. They're not capable of doing that. <laughs> that was the Chayshech, the Chayshech of the Greeks. The darkest part of the night is actually the, the, the dusk when there's an illusion of light, but really you're in darkness. That was the Chayshech. They make you feel something deep is going on. They make you feel there's an Oymek. <clears throat> you go a little deeper, there is nothing there. Now you and I have no idea what Yosef was doing with his eyes. <laughs> you and I have no idea what Yosef was doing with his hair. To be honest with you, the brothers missed it as well. They were not aware, like the Ramban brings, that when he was the Benz Konim, that his father Yaakov, Yaakov Avinu, the perfect human being of all time, gave over all the secrets of Kabbalah that he had learned in Shem Be'ever, he gave it over to Yosef. <coughs> Yosef knew how to create in a person a microcosm of what the whole world is supposed to look like. Yosef knew that Mashiach ben Yosef, who's going to bring Mashiach ben David, his job is to take the eyes and the hair of the whole universe, meaning to take the higher worlds and to take the lower worlds, and to bring them into perfect harmony. That's exactly Olam Haba. There's no place, there's no place called Olam Haba. Olam Haba is right here. The only difference between Olam Hazeh and Olam Haba is that Olam Hazeh is ugly and Olam Haba is beautiful. Meaning Olam Hazeh, the Yafi of Olam Hazeh, the Yafi of Olam Hazeh is a fake Greek Pneumius. The, the Enayim, the Yoifi, takes you to a place that you think there's beauty. You think the music of today is beautiful. The art of today is beautiful. You think it takes you to a deep inspiration, a place where there's deep thought. It's Kule, Kule Sheker. On this, Yosef waged war his whole life. Yosef was the Tzadik. Yosef was Tzion Michlal Yoifi, the beauty of the Beis Hamikdash. At the end of the day, the beauty of the Beis Hamikdash. Nine portions of Yafi were given to the world. Ten portions, nine were given to Tzion. The base of Miglash was filled with blood, an air of Pesach till their ankles. Because the Yafi was not the external Yafi, it was how it brought you into something that was Kedish Kadashim, a true Yafi. So the world to come is when the Chitzenius Dika Yafi of Olam Azar brings you naturally to a perfection to the higher Yafi of the higher world, where everything fits in to everything else, your neshama and your guf become one. That's the Yafi of Hashem Echad. That's the Yafi of the end of days, where everything fits in with everything else. Every one of the nations fits in with every other nation. When male and female are in harmony, when parent and child are in harmony, when king and people are in harmony. Today, everything's the opposite. Today, it's all ugly. Today, there's no parents and no children. 
Today, I don't want to, there's no male and there's no female, and there's certainly no melech and no am. That's gone. And on this, we have the war of Yosef. And on this, on Aser Beteves, we say we are Bamatsar or Bamatsaik. We say that we are in a siege and we cannot express ourselves. Today, Yerushalayim, the city that I live in, is an echo of an echo of an echo of its true Yoifi. Rabbi Shapiro used to say that the reason why people come to Yerushalayim and do not get, get Ruach HaKadosh is because when you look directly into the sun, you see nothing. At the moment now, we don't have those special glasses that allow us to look into the into the Yoifi, look into the sun and see the true Yoifi of Yerushalayim, to see what Sion is all about and the truest, truest level. So I want to summarize what I came to say. Asar Bateves, we today in 2020, maybe more than any time since the battle between the Greeks and the and the Hashmanayim, between the argument between Yosef and his brothers, more than ever before, we are under siege. We are on the Matsar of a Matzok, as we're going to read. I'm going to read this in another half an hour. You're going to read it tomorrow morning in the Slichas. That siege, that frightening siege that we're in, is a siege that we can no longer see properly. We see through their Yoifi, not our Yoifi. My Rebbe, Ramos Shapiro Zatzal, everything he stood for was to bring out that Yoifi. That was, if I could summarize in one moment, what he tried to do to our dar, he said to us, I'm not giving up on our generation. I'm not giving up on my Talmidim. I'm not giving up on NCS wires. I'm not giving up. You can still find Yaifi in this world. You can still go deeper and see Yaifi. First of all, he himself was the nearest to Yosef at Tzadik in terms of the Yaifi. I don't know if I, 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 I Moshe, I wanted to show this picture. I, I think you told me that uh, uh, share screen. Hold on, let's see if I can do this. Uh, does this work? Are you, uh, are you seeing a picture of my Rebbe? Okay. So if I could just share with you, uh, it's actually, I'm a little bit cheating because he's doing Havdallah. That's why his face is shining. But it just reminds me of his whole essence. Those of you that remember my Rebbe, his, everywhere he went, you felt that his Neshama was coming out of his guf. This was the Yoifi of what Rashi says, Ziv Cluster. It's the Yoifi of Moshe Rabbeinu's face under his mask. It's the Yoifi that my Rebbe Revolba used to say, that when Shabbos came in, Rabbi Yeruchim's face used to shine. So that is the true Yoifi. The Pnim and the Chitzenius are in perfect harmony. When Akiva Tatz, my friend Rabbi Akiva Tatz, who sat next to me for 20 years in Shir, Rabbi Akiva, when he gave his Hesped, he said something so incredible. And I never noticed it. He said, Rabbi Kiva said, I sat with him for, 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 for 20, 30 years. For me, it was uh, 30 years. And I never once saw him yawn in public. People that flew with him on a plane never saw him eat in public. To be honest, I don't know anyone that saw him sleep in public. We used to go to him and Schwartz, knowing that he had not slept for 24 hours. And he was fighting sleep and fighting yawning. I'm talking about when he was in his 70s. But you would not see him yawn and you would not see him close his eyes. And somehow or other he had conquered sleep and somehow or other he had conquered, he had conquered the, the, any external expression that wasn't beautiful. When I drove, I drove my Rebbe, Ramon Shapiro, from London to Manchester. It was me and my wife in the back of the car was Rabbi Kiva Tatz and Ramon Shapiro. It was an incredible drive. So at one point, he, 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 the, the Rebbe needed to go to the bathroom. And, and he said to me, I will not go to a truck stop. So at first I thought of it was vanity. I think about it, you know, that, 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 that Ramon Shapiro is not going to go into one of these truck stops. He's going to walk in with all this guy that are going in and out. He refused to go. And, and, and I realized that the Oymek, that the Yoifi that he had for him to go into that place would be a Chil Hashem. Zalomatim. Zalomatim, that a person of his beauty should go in to, 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 to where the truckers are. And he held himself back until we finally got to Manchester and we got to the wedding. And this is part of the Yoifi of who he was and what he was all about. 
So that was a very, very chitzenistic pnem. But the real, real pnem is that the yoifi of Rav Moshe was the way that he taught every chazal and showed pnemius that we never saw before. He saw the yoifi in Torah. He gave today, my friend Ariel Cicero has 3,000 shiurim in his house of Rav Moshe. Just one person. I mean, it's not, he collected it from all of us, including my own personal collection is by him. Ariel Cicero, who used to take him to South America. And his Torah has layers and layers and layers of, 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 of Oymek. I remember being in Shir once. I don't know if there's anyone out there that remembers a thing called a cassette recorder. I try to find one so that I could show you that you don't have to go to a museum to see a cassette recorder. Don't worry, Moshe, you're not gonna, you're not, ask your father. Your father for sure still has one. And uh, the, he, he was, there were once upon a time, they invented with cassette recorders a thing called a voice activator, which means that if you would stop, then the cassette would stop. And when you would talk again, it would stop going whir, whir all over again. So somebody brought a cassette and put it next to him and he was looking at it and he noticed that whenever he paused, the machine would pause. And whenever he would carry on talking, he would, the machine would carry on talking and suddenly he stopped the share. He couldn't deal with it anymore. He said, is this really happening? Every time I stop, this machine stops. And we said, yeah, it's called a voice activator. And he let out a crash. Rebbe let out a groan. And he said, Amal, once upon a time, I'm quoting his, his words. He says, the whole shear, the whole oimek of the shear came from the Rebbe's pauses. The whole yoifi came from those moments when he wasn't talking and he was communicating through silence. And that's exactly the, the, the true yoifi. There's always those hidden things that you have to go a little bit deeper to find. I just want to finish off by saying over, after Rav Moshe died, we found out stories and stories and stories and stories about him that we did not know. I remember being shocked to hear when Rabbi Yonis and David gave his hesped. He said, we all know, we mean Rabbi Yonis and David knew about Rav Moshe, that he was always davening for his Talmidim. And I realize now that all the siyat Dishmaya that I had in my life story is because I had a Rebbe davening for me. And I don't know how he did it. He never ever wrote anything down. He had a perfect memory. You would say, give him a name once and he would know that name forever. And he would daven for us. And I just want to share with you, and with this, I'm going to finish off a story I heard this week from my Chavrusa from a long, long time ago, Rabbi Sacha Berry, to, you know him as Suki Berry. Suki had a friend who had a, a, a tremendously difficult life including a tremendous tsaras with, with his first marriage. He went through Gehenim and back and he went through a, a lot, a lot of tsar. And Suki says, I'm taking to my Rebbe Rav Moshe Shapiro. He lived in America. When he came to Eretz Yisrael, he went over to Rebbe and he was in there for 20 minutes. And when he came out, he came out with a big smile, but his eyes were red. He said, Suki asked him what happened. He said, I told him my tsaras. And at some point or other, I told him so many tsaras and he shared with me that he had his own tsaras, that his daughter died. You, as you probably know, his daughter had cancer and, 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 and Ramesha had to bury his own daughter. And at that point then, when Ramesha told over his story, having heard that he, he said, he burst out crying. And he said, I also burst out crying. He said, we both put our heads on the table for could be at least for five minutes. We were just, we were just crying. And after Ramesha put his head up and he said to me, you have to get remarried. He said, I'm scared. I said, you'll get remarried within a year and you'll invite me to your wedding. And at that point, it was like Ruach HaKedosh. Within a year, Suki said, I was on a plane with Ramesha taking him to my friend's wedding. He went in specially for the kiyam of his bracha. And at the chasana, at the chasana, Ramesha gave the couple a bracha that they would have a child and, and he would be the son that could the bris. Four years later, four years later, Ramesha was in the Catskills for whatever reason. And this couple came to him 
and the woman went into Rav Moshe and cried and said, At my, when I was a Kala, you promised me a child. It's four years later, there's no child. So Rav Moshe was obviously shaken up a little bit. He says, give me a moment. And the way the story was said, he went into deep contemplation. And he said, Be'ez Hashem this year. Now I'm telling you now, I knew my Rebbe. I never knew the side of him, except for Po Basham, when I had my own personal stories. But I found out that a lot of my friends had these same personal stories. It, it doesn't fit. There was nothing about him that made him into like a Hasidic Rebbe that gives brachos. But here they had a child, had a son within a year, and Reb Meishu was Sandak. And this is something he hid, his true greatness. He hid it from everyone. He only gave a, that last outer section. But we saw the Ziv Oikinus. We saw the beauty from the Pnim coming out into his chutz in such a powerful way. Reb Meishu said, as we come to greet Mashiach, the only system of Chinuch that works, and with this I end, the only system of chinuch that works is called slabotka. Slabotka, I'm gonna I'm gonna stop the share over here for one more minute. I apologize because I know that looking at my Rebbe is so much more pleasant than looking at me. But I want to finish off and give to you his message for our dar. He said slabotka is the mahalach for our dar. What was slabotka? Slabotka is godless adam. Seeing the greatness in people again. I don't have to say this to you because we do this instinctively with our students. We build them up. God help us. For those of you who go through um, some, of the, some of the schools where they still have teachers who put people down, they are what they call, instead of being, instead of being bakers, they're barbers. Barbers cut, 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 cut. And bakers, they add more and add more and add more. But we know that the beauty of the real, real kayach is found in Slobodka. Ramesh Shapiro was asked, summarize Slobodka in one line. He said, a Slobodka, if you see a fence, you can't get to the other side because there's a wall. He says, a person who is a product of Slobodka, you don't need to build a wall. All you need to do is put rose bushes. A Slobodka Talmud cannot bring himself to step on a rose. He cannot take Yoifi and crush it. He's a Loma Sugal. And therefore the rose bush, the, the Yoifi of the roses is what creates the wall between him and the other side. As we go now through this, this terrible Tanis, the Matzah or Bamatzaik, the, the siege of Nebuchadnezzar, which is the siege of Yoifi, the siege, which I did not have a chance to talk about, the siege of the translation of the Torah into, into Greek, where we lost the, the Yoifi of the Torah. The Yoifi got lost. So that siege, we have to fight against it. The Avoida of Aser Beteves is wherever we can to see Yoifi, to build up our students with Yoifi, to identify true Yoifi in this world, to be able to say there's still Yoifi in music, there's still Yoifi in art, there's still Yoifi in Akash Baruch Hu's beautiful nature. And most of all, the Yoifi in Adam, we have to identify that. Be'ez HaShem Yisbarach, HaKadosh Baruch in Shemayim, excuse me, our Rebbe in Shemayim, should be made with Yeshe to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, that there's too much darkness, there's too much Choshech, there's too much Matzor or Matzoik, there's so much Saras in this world. HaKadosh Baruch Hu bring Mashiach, who will bring a world where the higher worlds and the lower worlds will be able to be in perfect Hatama, in perfect harmony. And we can laugh together in the world that's Kula Yoifi, in that place called Tzion, Michlal Yoifi, with the coming of Mashiach Meher Amenu. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you all of you for coming. I mean, thank you. Thank you.